In this lesson, we'll learn how to configure STP, short for Spanning Tree Protocol. Bear in mind that we could have an entire course devoted to STP only. It's quite complex, but I'll try to simplify it as much as possible and make sure you understand how to configure it. That's what we're after in this course. I've also created a document with additional explanations. You'll find it attached to this lesson. Refer to it if you'd like to find out more about STP. Now, let's get into the presentation. I'm going to use Paint to explain this. We have hubs in this topology, but it would be the same with a switch because in the beginning, MAC tables on switches are empty, so the switches would broadcast everything as well. Let's consider this scenario. PCA sends a packet. Source MAC address of that packet is the MAC address of PCA. The destination could be anything. It really doesn't matter for this example. So A sends a packet. That packet reaches this hub. A hub, as well as a switch, if its MAC address table is empty, will just send out a copy of that packet to each of its interfaces except to the interface where it received the packet. So it will send the packet to the left and to the right. Switch 1 will receive that packet on its F1 interface and it will memorize the source MAC address of that packet. Switch 2 will receive the same packet on its F1 interface and it will memorize the source MAC address of the packet here. At this time, both switch 1 and switch 2 think that PCA can be reached through their F1 interfaces. And that is true. What they will do next is they will forward, so S1 will forward the received packet to its F2 interface and switch 2 will also forward the received packet to its F2 interface. The lower hub will receive the packet coming from the left here and it will forward that packet to PCB but it will also send the packet out to its interface on the right side. The same will happen to the packet coming from switch 2. The hub will receive the packet here, it will forward that packet to PCB, and then it will forward that packet uh, to its interface on the left. Now S1 receives the packet, so that is this packet coming from the upper hu hub that went to the right of the upper hub. It will receive that packet here on its F2 interface and it will memorize the packet's source MAC address on the F2 interface as well. The same thing will happen for switch 2. It will receive this packet on its F2 interface and it will memorize the source MAC address. Other than both switches memorizing the source MAC address on all of their interfaces, those packets will continue to flow, so they will keep going in the loop. This packet will end up in this interface and the hub will forward it to the right and also to PCA. And then this packet will get in on this interface and the hub will again forward it to PCA, but also on this side. This right here is a full blown loop. This is why STP was created to block any redundant links. In layer three networks, it's routing protocols job to track redundant links. Traffic can even be balanced in between them, but in layer two networks, this isn't quite possible. There are ways to utilize redundant links and we will get to that later. For now, let's see how does STA, the spanning three algorithm, create a spanning three. Say we have three switches that apparently form a loop. These are their priorities and MAC addresses. As for the priority parameter, 
32,768 is a default value. Maximum is 61,440 and minimum is zero. It's stated in increments of 4,096, which means you can't use, for example, number three as a priority. This parameter is used by STP to decide which switch will be set as a reference point. Even if you're hearing about STP for the first time, it should be obvious that it builds some kind of a tree and trees must have roots. So just remember this, the root will be a switch with the lowest priority value and if they're all the same, so if all the priority values are the same on all switches, then a switch with the lowest MAC address will be chosen. In this diagram here, it's obvious that the top switch will be root and we'll call them by, by their MACs, A, B, and C. STP uses BPDU messages. It's short for Bridge Protocol Data Unit. And these messages carry information such as priority value and MAC address of the switch itself, but also of the port that sent the message. Once all the switches exchange these parameters, they'll figure out which one of them should be the root of the spanning tree. As already explained, the switch with the lowest priority or next MAC address becomes root. In our example, it will obviously be switch A. Now that we've figured that out, we need to decide which link out of these three we will need to disable. STP first looks at the ports of the root switch. By the way, if you're following STP terminology, you should call it root bridge. But since bridges are long gone, I'll refer to them as root switches. Anyway, all of the ports on a root switch will be enabled. There are two important port states, forwarding and blocking. If you need more details, refer to the additional explanations document. Other than that, there are two types of, of forwarding port modes, root port and designated port. On the root switch, which in this case is going to be this switch at the top, all ports are designated ports. That is what DP means here. Now, what about root ports? On all other switches, which are called non-root switches, exactly one root port can exist per switch per VLAN. But right now in this example right here, we have only one VLAN, so all other switches need to elect one root port per switch. A root port is an interface that has the lowest cost from given switch to the root switch. For example, if we look at switch B, it has two interfaces. B can reach the root switch through both of those interfaces, but it's cheaper to go through this one link instead of two links. Of course, these direct links are the cheapest, so we will choose the interfaces that are neighboring root switches interfaces. A small disclaimer here, the shortest path to root bridge will not always be the cheapest one. For example, if this direct link is an old serial link and these two are optic fiber and 20 times faster uh, than the direct one, STP will choose the longer but faster path. We will ignore this for now. At this point, it's obvious that the, the link between B and C will be disabled as that is the link that forms a loop. Unfortunately, it's not enough to just say this entire link will be disabled. In fact, only one of these two ports will be blocked and it needs to be decided 
which one. Now we said that each switch has exactly one root port. Similarly, each link has one designated port. If we look at the link between A and B, so this link, there is a root port, that's the interface connected to the cheapest link toward the root switch, and the other port on the root switch is designated port. If we look at the link between B and C, one of them should be designated, but the other one should be blocked. We'll choose a port with either a lower priority or a lower MAC address to be designated, and the other one will be blocked. Since we didn't change the priorities, we'll look at MAC, and switch B's MAC address is lower, so that will be our designated port. Apparently, the neighboring port will be a non-designated port, which means that it will be blocked. The result is that this entire link will not transfer traffic. In case you're already panicking and thinking of giving up, I got good news for you. STP does all of this automatically. In fact, it was running in the background in our previous exercise as well, and we didn't configure a single thing. But there are ways to influence STP process, and here's why you should do it. If you do let STP create your loopless, so to call it, tree on its own, your network topology might end up looking unexpectedly. For example, it may choose the oldest switch in your network to be root, which actually makes sense as its MAC address will likely be lower than the newer switch's MAC addresses. Usually, the root switch will get the most traffic, so it's quite inconvenient to have an old switch handle the biggest load. Other than that, I haven't mentioned this before, but you can configure a trunk link to carry only specific VLANs. In that case, you really want to influence STP to make sure you don't accidentally block traffic. The first thing to do would be to manually pick a root bridge. I'm going to show you two commands to use to pick a root bridge manually, but there's actually only one way to change the priority value. The default value is 32,768, and whatever value you enter, it has to be an increment of 4,096. To make sure a switch becomes root, use the first command, root primary. This command will decrease the priority value from 32,768 to 24,576, so 2 times 4,096. If you use the second command, root secondary, this value will be decreased to 28,672, which is exactly 4,096. Since it's all about the priority parameter, you can manually pick this value using the following command. The only thing you should remember is that whatever value you pick, it has to be an increment of 4096. A small disclaimer here, let's say you manually change priorities of all switches in your network to 20,480, for example. So all of the switches in your network have this priority, 20,480. If you use this first command, root primary, on a random switch on your network, what do you think will happen? Does the switch a, change the priority to 24,576, or B, will it know that the lowest priority value is already lower than that? If you think B, you're right. In that scenario, the switch will have already learned the priority values of other switches, that's what those BPDUs are for, and issuing this command, root primary, 
will actually make the switch decrease its priority to 16,384, which is exactly 4,096, lower than the current lowest value in the network. Okay, a couple more infos. So far, we've only talked about single VLAN networks and how STP works there. But sometimes you will have multiple VLANs in your network. In that case, it's possible to have a different tree for each of those VLANs. This means that for each VLAN, you will choose a different root bridge. That way, some of the redundant links blocked in one VLAN will be used by another VLAN, which is great. Let's look at an example. Here we have the same topology from earlier, and each switch has computers from three VLANs attached to it. Let's say that for VLAN 3, we pick the top switch to be the root. In that case, these two links, the ones in red, will be active and the one between the bottom two switches will be blocked. If we choose this switch to be the root for VLAN 5, this link will be blocked. Similarly, if we choose this third switch to be root for VLAN 7, now this link will be blocked. In this setup, all of the links will be utilized. This is called per VLAN STP, since every VLAN gets its own tree. Of course, you can pick the same switch for root for all VLANs, but you would be missing out on using the redundant links. All right, only one more information left, I promise. As you can guess from all this old terminology such as bridge instead of switch, STP was invented a long time ago. Once you make your changes, for example, you pick a root bridge manually, a new STP tree needs to be calculated. In order to speed up the process, a faster version of STP was invented and it's called RSTP or rapid spanning three protocol. Fortunately, you can configure both per VLAN spanning three and make it a rapid PVST with only one command, spanning three mode rapid PVST. And then in the end, an additional thing that will additionally speed things up, port fast. PortFast will be configured only on access links or those links that will not connect any network devices but rather endpoints because if you connect a printer to a port there is no way that will end in a loop. Okay, I should probably not say that because weirder things have happened, but if all is done correctly, access ports usually don't even need to run STP, it just slows everything down. So to avoid this additional calculation, you as an administrator can select those interfaces that won't even be in a position to ever enter a loop and configure them with port fast. The command for this is also very simple. That would be all we'll need to know for now. Let's go to the exercise.